as an organization, we have been able to institute safeguards to prevent such a recurrence. I'll go straight to the, the submission. We've given you a sense of the annual procurement plan for tenders that are greater than 2 million. And just for the financial year 2020, there were about 87 projects and the overall value of the annual procurement plan for financial year 2020 was 1.3 billion. Uh, there were six deviations uh, there that were greater than the 2 million threshold for open tenders. And there were about 17 expansions uh, in that same period. For the current fiscal uh, 2021, we have 137 projects and the overall value of the annual procurement plan for this fiscal is 2.5 billion. And we have two deviations there that are greater than two mil the 2 million threshold. And as at 31st August, there was only one approved deviation. In total, honorable members, the SABC has 228 active contracts under management as at June uh, 30th, 2020. And the value of those are at 1.8 billion. And, and I think uh, because of just to situate it, out of the 228 active uh, contracts, about 30 deviations and expansions uh, have been submitted to National Treasury. And an analysis of those uh, is as follows. There's 19 deviations and 11 expansions. 15 are for 12 months and the other 15 are multi-year. 14 of the 30 relates to general OPEX and the other 16 relate to industry specific. It's the balance that we spoke about the last time to ensure that uh, whatever we do, it does not affect business continuity. So of the 30 deviations, 25 uh, were supported by Treasury and uh, five of those were not supported. We will also give you, a, a as we have given you the information that relates to TV licenses on insourcing and uh, outsourcing. Uh, we've looked at the cost implication as well as the performance of some of the debt collection agencies. Our model is very clear as the SABC when it comes to collecting TV licenses. 55% is internal collections, 38% from debt collection agencies, and 12% from retail. And the head of TV licenses here will take more questions and clarity on these matters. So I think uh, 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 I would then request that Yolandi just briefly also uh, comment on some of these. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Good morning, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, and Chairperson of my board and Auditor Nerezk and other members um, present in this session. Thank you very much for the opportunity to engage with you again. Uh, following the previous engagement um, and taking away some very va valuable lessons and input, uh, firstly, we, we responded to actions identified at that time and submitted for your consideration a response on the 19th of August that dealt specifically uh, with the relationship and um, history with Inyala and the various products uh, we source from them and the reasons why, as well as we clarified some questions that was pre presented to us on the news agencies and the award then specifically an audit finding that dates back to the 2017-18 audit period. And last but not least was more detail on the performance of our TV license unit and uh, with the express focus on the debt collecting agencies. For purposes of this session today, we have um, endeavoured to provide you further information uh, on the seven items identified and where relevant we comment on uh, potential irregularities and what is being done about it. Uh, we, we tried to deal specifically with a few themes as we present these matters for your consideration. Just a refresher on, on background. The past procurement processes, we attempted to clarify observations around what could be deemed date anomalies, um, since we have now uh, made an effort to familiarize ourselves with, with the extensive history of each of these items. We speak briefly about the, the current contract, its status, um, we comment on potential irregularities or not and what's being done and then the status of the current procurement contract. I think in essence, um, as, as a layperson, both in the industry and as far as technical uh, in broadcasting um, terminology and uh, products and services are concerned, 
it's my takeaway that uh, an organization can procure either perpetual licenses, in other words, you are the owner of it, um, but you have to maintain maintenance and support um, every year, or you can buy subscriptions licenses. In a number of instances, with Inyala, um, we, are, we are the owner of perpetual licenses uh, that uh, and the product is deemed to still suit the organization's strategic roadmap and technical integration. Uh, and Inyala have positioned themselves in the course of a, about a 20-year uh, period as one of the key suppliers um, and also a key reseller of international broadcasting equipment in South Africa. It's a small industry with a small number of main players. And as such, um, it appears that they are one of the key resellers of a number of the products that we use, and that's also being used by our competitors um, in, in this industry. The Atashi Vitara matter is a support storage on our um, that is in present in the organization. Uh, we speak about that further. Um, with Telcom, uh, the Metro Ethernet system that connects um, Auckland Park and all the regions, uh, what would be of interest there is that following the tender process, uh, Telcom was then awarded, but the, the, the parties did not account for the commission period that was required. That period took about 14 months. It is apparently standard um, practice, um, but in that period of time, particularly with the uh, challenges our organization was facing, these things were not um, attended to properly. Um, JASCO is uh, for what is called an AVID um, system, which provides, I think, software in our um, a, a broadcasting environment as well. Again, I believe it is a perpetual license, and hence you, we are the owner of it. We, we still believe that the, the product is suitable for our technical integration, but we do need to maintain uh, maintenance and support. There were interruptions in maintenance and support here and there in that specific case, but what then happens, you simply do not have access to the maintenance and support. On debt collectors, we submitted an extensive presentation. Um, uh, and we will be happy to engage further with you. SAP, again, um, the organization decided in 2004 to procure uh, an ERP system. It followed an open tender process. It was awarded to a consortium, uh, the, and we procured, again, perpetual, perpetual licenses uh, with the installation that started in about 2007. <coughs> Uh, and, and we worked with the consortium to bring the, to up the implementation into fruition. And since then, we have been procuring licenses or maintenance and support, in this case, directly from the OEM, because uh, when we started the relationship, uh, SAP preferred to, to deal directly with government. These days, it is different, um, and as such, we are currently in the process of procuring, through an open tender process, our maintenance and support. Uh, you can also see at the very first few pages of our submission, um, dated the 28th of August, deals with the current open tender processes that's ongoing. 21st century uh, start started in 2014, um, stopped and started uh, for a number of reasons, uh, extensive management changes, um, the, the struggle to get uh, organized labor around the table to engage on what we wanted uh, in the form of a new sales commissioning system. Uh, resulted in extensive delays. Um, the, the contract was, however, uh, uh, scripted such that it will be open-ended, but only until the work has been completed. Uh, the work restarts in 2016. Um, it stops again, and we have then restarted it in 2019, and we are currently in the process of just finalizing the last few elements. Uh, a critical one would be further consultation with the unions. So um, thank you very much, Chair. And I think at this point, exactly at 10.15, I will hand back to yourself and the committee. Um, thank you. All right. No, thank you very much. I think it was important that you get uh, your comments on the submissions that you have made and the context. I'm sure that as the meeting goes on and the questions are posed, we'll be able to provide other clarities. So, right, Honorable Hatebe, can I hand over to you, uh, and then you will indicate uh, when you are done. So, Honorable Hatebe with an H, uh, Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Um, hopefully, I am audible. Um, uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, Chair, allow me to also... Um, welcome the ex executive authority, uh, the deputy minister, 
and SABC together with the board uh, uh, chairperson and other uh, uh, officials responsible for the daily running of, of SABC. Um, Honorable Chair, um, as this uh, standing committee on, on public accounts, um, our concern uh, really it's in relation to what appears to be an abuse uh, when it comes to deviation and expansion, Chair. Um, al although this practice, Chair, is allowed by law, and it is allowed only when it comes to issues of exceptional circumstances, uh, unavoidable uh, uh, situation, and only as it relates to the sole uh, uh, supplier. Uh, but, Chair, what we are seeing uh, uh, in SABC and uh, many other uh, state entities is that uh, deviations are now used as a normal uh, uh, practice or chair what appears to be a deliberate creation of, of, of conditions that will justify uh, the use of deviation and expansion and failure which uh, uh, that could be regarded as the sabotage to the National Broadcasting Cooperation if one were to refuse uh, to ap uh, approve such uh, a deviation, Chair. And in this regard, Chair, I would like to demonstrate why I am strongly of the view and my opinion that here we're dealing with uh, conditions that are deliberately uh, uh, created. Uh, let, let's take uh, this contract of Inala, Honorable Chair which is the support and maintenance contract. Um, I understand and I take the note uh, that uh, some of these uh, activities predates the current board, but there is one particular case uh, which is recent. But let's start um, on the 1st of April 2014 to the 9th of June 2014, which is 70 days. SABC did not have a support and maintenance contract for 70 days. Second, the chair from the 10th of June uh, 2016 to the 30th of June uh, 2016, 21 days, again, SABC did not have the support and maintenance contract. Now, let's come to the recent and the contract under uh, uh, a question from the 1st of April. 2019 to the 30th of March 2023, more than 365 days a year, SABC did not have a, a support and maintenance contract. Now, what are the risk chair associated with this uh, uh, shenanigans? It's correctly indicated and in, in, uh, in black and white from the report that should there be any failure or malfunctioning, this will lead to a revenue lost, public trust and worship seriously affected. Now, when I argue that uh, uh, these uh, uh, conditions are deliberately co uh, uh, created, you, you have a situation, as I've highlighted, of having to leave for 70 days, 21 days, and more than 300 and 65 days without a maintenance contract. Now, this contract that we are referring to expired on the 31st of March, 2019. Now, Chair, National Treasure only received a letter which was dated 18th October, seven months later after this contract has expired which was dated on 18th of October 29, requesting deviation. Now, National Treasury only received this letter uh, three months later from the date in which the letter was written, which was uh, January uh, 2020. It only took National Treasury only seven days to approve uh, the deviation. After the National Treasury has approved this deviation, it took one and a half months for a bid adjudication committee to sit and approve this contract. And only on the 20th 
my apologies, the incoming calls disturbing the, the, the feed. Only on the 24th of March, a, a letter of award was signed and sent to Inal. Now, Chair, we are told uh, that based on these conditions that I've, 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 I've highlighted, SABC suffered a, a, a serious a, a, a failures and it cost SABC uh, uh, to use the money to buy uh, some storage disk uh, to compensate for the time that it did not have uh, uh, the support and maintenance contract. Now, the question that one would want to get clear answers from, which is not uh, uh, clearly indicated uh, uh, in this report, is that who are the responsible persons that exposed SABC to these severe risks. Second aspect to, the, to this, uh, what cause of action uh, uh, did SABC take against these officials that were um, involved into exposing SABC to such risk? And the third aspect that I would like to get an understanding, what other failures uh, uh, or risk occurred during a uh, 365 days where you did not have this maintenance contract. And I want uh, to you guys, and I, I'm glad that you have given us a, a sense that you have brought the entire team with you. So I want you to quantify in terms of rent values uh, uh, what type of, of risk were there and how much money was spent during the time where you did not have this maintenance contract. Now, when these contracts are brought before deviation, chair one is left with no choice but to approve this deviation uh, as exceptional circumstances and, and, and sole uh, uh, supplier or sole provider. But one is interested in these three questions, chair. Who are these responsible individuals? Uh, because, chair, this is a very clear indication of a serious challenge when it comes to contract management. It indicates a lack of understanding of the basic contract life cycle and the renewal phase of contracts. One would want to know where was the CFO, where was the managers responsible for supply chain when all this happened, and where was the board? How can it be possible that on three occasions, dating from 2014, 2016 to 2019, a contract will expire and you will have 70 days, nothing. Hence, I'm saying, Chair, in my assertion, I am justified to say these conditions are deliberately created for us to be pushed to the corner to accept as normal and as a standard practice the issue of deviation and expansion. Let me pause the Chair and, and get an answer to those three questions. All right, no, that's fine. I think um, that we've given a very comprehensive background and your questions are very pointed. And so uh, let's hand over to the board and uh, the officials to provide a response uh, to that very comprehensive first set of questions. Thank you, honorable uh, uh, members, and thank you, honorable chair. Um, like I indicated, that I have the entire team, both executive and operational. Uh, team. So let me request the CFO to go first because there's some financial aspects and then um, or COO first and then we'll go to the CFO to brief to brief you on the financials and then the technical guy here, uh, uh, GE Technologies with me also to provide some technical detail in that order. Thank you, Chair. All right. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Scopa and honorable members. Uh, it's Ian speaking. Yeah, the COO. Um, we, we hear you in terms of saying that the, this is abuse of deviations. Um, I think it's important to understand the context that we operate in. While we certainly want to be fully compliant, we are uh, running a commercial business in terms of 97% uh, uh, of our revenue is generated through commercial activities. And we are operating in a highly, highly regularized uh, and regulated uh, environment. 
Um, so if you look at, for example, there's two different types of license agreements. You get a perpetual license, which is indefinite. You can use it as long as you want to. The Inala one that is mentioned falls into that category. So that is ours to use. However, through uh, PFMA and, and National Treasury uh, uh, notes and, 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 and regulations, we have to go out periodically renewing something that is strategic for ourselves. It, it is very difficult to operate because our competitors use the same software. They are able to engage in five to 10 year agreements with substantially less costs for that. We, however, are not able to do that and have to renew on a periodic basis, which enables us then not to be able to compete uh, adequately, but also we get this notion that we are abusing um, the use of deviations. However, in our environment, those are strategic uh, software or hardware elements, and there isn't any other supplier for that. And so we constantly have to renew that, but we've got to go through a, a whole host of hoops. Now, the periods that was mentioned in terms of us not having maintenance and, and support, there's, there's two risks there. One, that we are not going to be able to support that hardware and software as we have seen, and if we do have system failures, uh, the time to restore takes much longer. We still do have access to the supplier of that system though, but because we do not have a support and maintenance agreement in place, the time that they will take to restore, and certainly the cost is going to be substantially more because we would have to do it on a one-on-one -on -one basis as opposed to making use of a support and maintenance agreement. So unfortunately, as I said, in our environment, we do want to be compliant, um, but because we are uh, extremely, extremely restrictive, um, and we have to compete with our competitors using similar software, but they are able to have long-term agreements with suppliers, which we are not able to. We end up in a cycle of deviation. I, I do uh, uh, concur that due to a couple of um, um, positions, both in supply chain and ourselves that were uh, vacant, there was substantial amount of churn in terms of people acting in those positions, and certainly not the necessary uh, or high quality of planning um, in, in, in the past that was done there. Those gaps have been closed, and we do now have, for the first time, GEs in, in all of our, our key positions, except obviously supply, supply chain that we're still working on. Thanks, Chairman. I hand over to the CRO. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Um, I just wanted to speak about a couple of themes in addition to what the, the CEO also has reported. Mine, uh, probably a little bit more supply chain focus, why you see the, the lapses in the periods in recent times um, and what we have in place or are doing about it to, to address it. Uh, let me just state that we do have an automated contract management system. In other words, business unit owners um, get notifications up to 12 months before a contract expires. And then it will be in a six months and three months periods again. What we did find, however, and that's also what the COO touched on, is the specific division, um, our technology division, had I think at some point about 40 active <coughs> positions, um, many of them in senior roles. Uh, it would also happen that relatively junior people had to act in positions um, much higher than what their standard scale code is because there simply were not enough people and those that were there were, um, were not um, senior enough to be able to deal with decision making. Uh, so it presented the organization with a number of challenges. We, we are also required to rotate acting positions. Uh, and as such, you would find that the instability in leadership in a position, in a, organ, um, in a, a department, would uh, would create the, uh, a fertile, uh, growing opportunity, if you will, for something like this to happen. Add to that that in the supply chain environment, as well as um, I think you might remember that I shared with you before. The whole of the supply chain management was also acting um, until as recently as December when the first permanent person have been appointed. 
You also sit with tremendous skills gaps um, as well as vacancies in that department. And as a result, you, you find um, that that together with a business unit where there's uh, constant changes in those that makes decisions, your contract management automated system, notification goes to perhaps the wrong person or somebody who's no longer acting, and therefore you find that these things take time, uh, unacceptable as it may be. And since then, we have um, been trying to address it. As the COO says, we, we have uh, started to establish permanent leadership. Um, you, the second thing then is that the business uh, in general is very immature in its engagement with supply chain uh, and the requirements thereof. Um, it is the business certainly that this management inherited about two years ago. Uh, we, we, I do believe we have made tremendous efforts. Um, in, a, in a discussion like this, you, you do reflect and think it is never nearly enough and there's still so much to be done. Um, but we have already uh, refreshed an SOP, our policy. We have had numerous training engagements uh, for interest like another one is actually scheduled tomorrow with National Treasury to be able to empower business uh, with the knowledge that they need in terms of how they need to engage with supply chain. Because up until about 2017, 18, um, that, that never received the attention that was required back then, never mind that today is a very significant focus. So um, that is some of the themes that would result in, in the lies that you see here today. Uh, once we do get the approval from Treasury, as you pointed out, it then takes us another two months to get it through the process. Uh, we have extensive processes inside that needs to be followed uh, once we receive those approval for reports to be prepared, final governance documentation to be received, meetings to be scheduled uh, with the relevant decision makers to come to the final, um, to assess this, the, the submission and make their final uh, recommendation on it. Um, it is um, probably too long. Uh, I think we are conscious of that. Uh, we have recently also um, been reviewing all the supply chain processes and for inefficiencies, and there are plenty, and that's the kind of stuff that you see here. Uh, and we are, uh, as we are going to update our SOP, we are taking away some of the steps that we created ourselves and which has just created bureaucracy and administration, which slows the organization and business down. So I hope that gives you a, a bit of a sense of why those dates um, uh, lapse. That it's uh, certainly uh, far from acceptable um, is not, um, there's no dispute about that. Uh, before I hand over to the technical, um, uh, our GE for technology, uh, I think the other comment from what I could gather related to um, uh, a bullet in that report that we submitted in the middle of August that speaks to during the prolonged period that where there was no contract in place, we suffered failure of storage systems, which impacted on the transmission. Uh, we had to procure new drives to replace drives damaged. So the way myself as a layperson understood this was it, it was to position uh, how the organization um, uh, uh, is able to actually deal with an emergency and, and fix it. Um, I did not get the sense that the, the matters were related, but I think let me hand over to our um, GE technology to maybe in, enlighten us all. Thank you, G. Thank you very much, uh, Stefo, and good morning to the Honourable Chair and the Honourable Members. Um, it, it's really a not a very complicated um, licensing model that we entered into with Inala regarding the Harmonic TV Player System. It's, it's, it's a perpetual license or it's a perpetual licensing model. So what happens in there is that you own then the entire system it becomes yours so that's what we took as the as the sabc on this one what happens is when the maintenance and support agreement that comes to an end the system continues to work but it works at that version as in the version that you bought it at or the last version when you updated it with your last support and maintenance um, agreement what then um, uh, it creates then dangers for you that whenever there is issues you then won't have access to um, the technical guys from the local supplier that the OEM has chosen in the country to um, um, help out. So what happens in this case is that our technical guys then would then be now in a way forced to be the ones that act as technical um, I mean support and maintenance guys on this. 
Yeah. And it, it does create a risk, of course, um, um, that I mean, it might impact on transmission going forward. So um, in here, when the disks failed and were out of contract, our guys had to obviously go and uh, um, um, procure new uh, newer disks, and then we, we we had to inject. I mean, to to put those onto our ingest system, and then we we managed to kind of bring the system onto life, and it continued to work. But uh, um, it's always always advisable that you continue to have those uh, um, support and maintenance agreements with the local supplier, because what happens in this case is that the original equipment manufacturer, the OEM, at that um, um, deals with uh, this playout system um, they actually choose you know who in the country would actually be supportive of that and uh, you have to work via them so you don't necessarily have to go directly onto the OEM even though I mean one of the things I'm trying to do going forward is to ensure that we do have a very strong relationship with some of those OEMs but uh, um, when it comes to then these licenses that we have with these people, is uh, we always have to be working with them on a on a regular basis so that they can help us whenever there is a um, um, a technical issue. So um, um, the subscription license, as everybody else knows, is when it ends, you stop using the system altogether. In this case, we continue to using the system, but um, you just don't have access to the technical guys and support guys in order for them to assist you with this. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. All right, no, that's okay. fine. Let's hand over to oh, Honorable, Honorable, Honorable All right, Honorable Hattab, you can proceed. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll, yeah we'll, in I, your hand. No, okay. I, I don't think SA, um, SABC uh, uh, is responding to my questions. They are telling me what I told them. In fact, they are repeating what I'm, I, I, I expressed to them and what is written in black and white. Chair, here the issue is the deliberation of uh, uh, of creating these conditions, uh, which leads to us concluding that uh, you are abusing these deviations. You knew that the contract will end at some point. You knew that Inala is the sole uh, supplier. Chair, it took you more than 365 days to renew this contract. We're not questioning that uh, you're the sole supplier. Now, as a result of that, it is written in black and white that SABC suffered storage and this system failure. You had to procure because you did not have the maintenance contract in place. Now, what I want to know, who within your uh, entity is responsible for creating that? You cannot have a contract that takes more than a year, even advertising a tender in a competitive bid chair does not take a year to conclude. With all these obvious cases in front of you, it is obvious now for everyone to see that Inala is the sole uh, supplier. Why does it take a, a, a bid adjudication committee more than three months after a, a, a national treasurer has signed for you to conclude the paperwork? Why does it take one and a half months for you to write an, an, an award letter? It does not make sense. We are not talking about a, a, a bid adjudication committee that needs to sit with more than a, a, a three a, a bid a, a document in front of them to evaluate which one is which. It's only one, it's deviation. So honorable there has to be someone, Honorable Chairperson, that is responsible for exposing SABC to these risks. And you have not been able to quantify this risk. The failure occurred and there was no system in place in the form of a management contract. You had to go out, uh, uh, use resources and your internal account to buy another storage disk. Had you had a, a maintenance contract in place, you wouldn't have incurred this cost. Quantify to us how much uh, uh, did it cost you, and are there any other costs that we are not aware of? Who are these pe uh, uh, persons involved, and what type of position do they hold within your department? Are they still there? I fail to understand, and I cannot accept as normal uh, that uh, it takes more than 365 days to approve one deviation when it only took seven days for National Treasury to approve such. With such risk clearly explained and exposed, has National Treasury, it took uh, him seven days 
to, to approve. Yet after that, there's another unexplained three months. Perhaps it's three months from those documents to move from National Treasury to get into SABC in the fourth industrial revolution world. So can well, I get, let's do this. Can yeah. I get an let's... explanation, Chair, in, in, in yeah. to the culprits involved? And even though the, the, the issues they are saying are technical, explain to us in the layman terms what does it entail uh, uh, to get uh, uh, to a point where it takes you three months after National Treasury has given a go ahead to conclude a, 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 a contract? Thank you. All right, let's get responses to that. But your, your initial three questions were very pointed, and I think they are pertinent. Uh, because the issue is notwithstanding everything else that has been said, why the late application when there's an automated tracking system? So let's, let's, exactly. your quest, yeah, all right, SABC, over to you. Go with the technical first. Fair. Thanks, Chair. Um, we'll respond uh, between the, the CFO and myself. I'll speak to the technical side first, and then she'll speak to the procurement side. So uh, from, a, from the technical side in terms of what have we lost, so this is a stored environment that we are talking about. So in, in our time, it's about downtime that we, we worried about. And so in this case, we wouldn't necessarily have downtime because we could move over to live environment and use some other content. So a support and maintenance agreement, it's, it's like an insurance. Um, so it's, it's a grudge purchase, but it's a very important purchase as well. So you only use it as and when you do need it. So if you look at it from a cost perspective, we've, we've had that one incident in that period of time which worked in our favor. So technically speaking, we would have actually saved because we saved on the support and maintenance for that year, but that's not how you want to run a business because it increases the risk, okay? So we were very lucky in terms of that uh, and, and we got away from that. So from a financial perspective, we probably would have done better off uh, during that period. But as I say, we do not want to take those risks and we fully agree with you in terms of that risk. Um, and what we've done to, to close those gaps. So I'll hand over to the CFO too. Yeah. If I may share, um, I fully understand the uh, questions raised by the Honourable Member, but I think we need to bear in mind that we are stabilizing and rebuilding an organization that was literally hollowed out and completely dysfunctional. It was rendered dysfunctional. Uh, the, the point that the CFO made earlier on, we have had a series of acting people, junior people acting in senior positions. That uh, affects decision making, it affects turnaround times, but very importantly, it affects uh, the stability of the organization. And I do not think we created conditions for deviations as well as expansions. If you look at the current contracts, we have 228 active contracts, and it's 30 of those that are actually deviations and expansions. And we, we're doing whatever we can to ensure that we instill sound corporate governance in the organization, particularly taking into cognizance that this is really what we have been handed. The other issue that honorable member mentions is who is responsible for this? I do think that uh, we need to bear in mind that in relation to these deviations and expansions, these are older transgressions and it becomes difficult to secure information and identify people that were originally responsible for these. And it's also further complicated by the fact that most of the implicated individuals have since left the SABC. I'll just give you a sense, honorable member. Between 2018 and 20, I mean 2012 and 2018, we had a total of 186 cases uh, that our forensic had to investigate. Most of these cases they date back a number of years, and were, they were left incomplete or abandoned uh, by the previous management teams. And what we have had to do is to look into all of these cases, 
Currently, as at uh, June 2018, the SABC has registered over 255 disciplinary cases emanating from all of these previous lapses in governance. So from our side, I, I really would want members to appreciate that we're dealing with an organization that had been rendered dysfunctional. We're rebuilding. We want to ensure that we stabilize it. This is why in all of these key supply chain management positions, we have now begun to bring in skilled people that can help us in this process. Thank you very okay. much. Uh, Honorable Chair, all right, my, my apologies. apologies. Okay, just Chair, hold on. I'm, I'm, all right, wait, wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. Um, CFO, are you building on that argument or are you bring in a new perspective so that Honorable does not lose his track of thought on the follow up that he wants to do? Um, thank you, Chair. I was going to talk about the dates. Um, okay. I'm not sure. All right, it's fine. Let's give him a chance to let you finalize this follow up with the CEO, CEO and then you can come in with that. But Honorable Hatt, over to you. Chair, I am referring to the recent sequence of event from the 31st of March 2019 to the 1st of April 2020. Uh, I have highlighted the other years to indicate the trend that this is not new. Now I need answers of what is recently and which happened before them when they were there. Those that they cannot account for I, I, I can argue some other time because I'm not satisfied with the, with the reasoning, but respond to what happened between the 31st of March 2019 to the 1st of April 2020. And give me, quantify, you, you have bought storage disk, there were damages to it, but you are not giving us the quantity. How much did it cost to replace the damage? You have suffered in terms of transmission. Quantify that cost. You are not given responses, the direct responses, because your risk assessment indicates that you have suffered in terms of transmission. You had, as a result, to buy a, a disc to replace the damaged disc. I need to know how much did it cost you? All right, very clear. All right, responses, please. Quantify. Let's speak to the rent themselves. Because um, ultimately you. that's the issue. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I will um, briefly just uh, clarify or attempt to clarify the date. Uh, firstly, our letter, um, as the Honourable Member pointed out, is dated the 8th of November. We submit that letter to Treasury that same day. Um, I have the, the email evidence of it. Uh, I am not sure what transpires in Treasury between the 8th of November and when we receive their response on the 27th of January, where they refer to our letter um, dated, in fact, the, the, the 18th of no, of October. Um, it, it, uh, I know there were some changes in the Treasury team who, who dealt with the SABC uh, in the course of the past year, and, and I think that um, that might have resulted in here and there a, a possible delay. I don't know. So when we then get there later on the 27th of January, we proceed firstly as they required um, that we must do a reasonability test on the pricing. Um, there, point six in the letter, uh, between uh, the 28th of January and when the, the report uh, that goes to BEC uh, is... Uh, is uh, for one second. I'm not sure who's got their mic on, but there's somebody dropping things somewhere. You can um, sorry, this. thank you, Chair. Sorry, I think somebody just came in and, and you might have heard the door slam. Um, so, when we then get the letter, um, Treasury's letter, as I say, we proceed to do the reasonability test um, and the report um, is then finalized in the course of the four or five weeks from the 27th of January to the 3rd, 16th of March um, and the BEC, uh, that's also when the BEC sits uh, or shortly there are, sorry, BIC sits. And shortly thereafter, then, uh, on the 27th of, well, we sign it on the 24th of March, and 
the supplier signs it on the 27th of March. So uh, two months um, after we got the response from Treasury, uh, the award has taken place. Um, and I, I think the, uh, the checking of the pricing added a bit of time. Uh, and as I say, I am unable to, to indicate what transpired between our submission of the letter to Treasury and when they respond. Um, if I may, uh, if my G technology is ready, um, he will take over and deal with the members' questions around the failure of the desks. Thank you very much, uh, CFO. Um, and thank to uh, the honourable member for the question. So we had about seven discs that failed, and uh, the replacement cost for each disc is around 45,000. So in total, it was just over 315,000 rents that we spent when those discs uh, failed. But uh, just for the members to note, there was no break in transmission. So it didn't really, um, because we've got a very good business continuity management system and disaster recovery system that we've put in place. So there was absolutely no break or nobody noticed anything, but it had to be done because it was posing a risk to the organization. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. To add on to that, um, although we, we paid that extra 315, if we had paid maintenance and support for that year, um, it would have been in the region of probably 1.2 million. Honorable Hart, Deb. I did not get a, a sense what uh, what happened between the 31st to October. I understand the unjustifiable reasoning. And I also fail to understand why would SADC not bother to inquire if indeed we have submitted that letter to National Treasury uh, on the 24th of October. Why wait for three months and don't make a follow-up? Because in the letter from National Treasury, so it says National Treasury acknowledge a receipt of your application dated the 24th of October 2019 and received on the 20th of January 2020. As a reasonable and accountable person, one would have inquired what happened between October and January that National Treasury only receives, uh, uh, as he clearly stated, that in his letter, I only received your application on the 20th of January. We did not bother to inquire what happened so that you avoid such a, 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 a transgression from happening in future. You cannot explain to us what happened. You, say, uh, you cannot explain. You want us to accept as a reasonable response that you cannot uh, uh, explain what happened. Yet, you are telling us that seven discs in that process were affected. And, and you did not explain to us when the contract expired on the 31st of, of March. Why did it take you so long up to October, seven months, to apply to National Treasury for, for, for approval of division? Because you knew when you entered into this contract, this person is a sole provider. What happened within that seven months? Tell me what was happening within that seven months. That, 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 that's it, Chair. And I need the responsible officials. Okay. There is someone assigned to manage this contract. There are contract managers, and this yeah, yeah, they've already explained to us that there are systems in place, electronic system in place to detect when the contract is about to expire. What went wrong? Okay, let's get that response, and then uh, honourable members, you can come in, and then we'll tie down in the section, right? Yes, APC. Thank you, Chair. I will just go first. Um, uh, in an effort to uh, allay the members' concern, we certainly follow up on a very regular basis. Um, and sometimes, I even not sometimes, um, when the delays get uh, beyond about, I think, Treasury's turnaround times, typically uh, they commit to between two weeks and a month. 
Um, and these things then escalate up to me. I get lists of the outstanding uh, submissions. I follow up with um, my peer on the other side. So these, these follow-ups do take place on a very regular basis um, because we are acutely aware of the consequences of the delays. Um, but we do al allow Treasury about two weeks to a month to, to uh, consider our uh, uh, request first. As for the period from uh, even before March, when, when the contract then expires in end of March up to October, um, I, I hear your concerns. Um, I, I did try to speak to some thematic issues um, that the organization is confronted with. Um, I will hand over to um, some of the, the COO um, that will help us further. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Chair and Honorable Khadebe. So uh, to, to Honorable Khadebe's earlier point that we knew that this was a sole supplier. Yes, we do, uh, but the, the, the whoops we have got to go through to prove that to National Treasury, it's quite onerous. So we know that it's a sole supplier. We would want to enter into a five-year agreement. I'm pretty sure that that's what our competitors are doing. Um, they have given us costs from, for a five-year agreement, which is extremely lucrative for us, but we were not allowed to enter into that. And we tried to get at least a two-year agreement in place, which was a, a substantial reduction, um, but we only got approval for one year. A one-year agreement is exceptionally expensive because they add the cost onto that. Um, and we went to and fro, but that was the outcome of that. We should be allowed, because this is a sole supplier, because it is a strategic system, we should be allowed to en enter into a five-year agreement with them. That would immediately eliminate any need for deviations. And to uh, Honorable Khadeva's earlier point, then we wouldn't be accused then of abusing uh, the deviation uh, process. Thank you, Chair. All right, uh, colleagues, any follow-ups? Colleagues, Honorable Hart, David. Uh, Chair? You can proceed, Bob. Yeah, no, I and I think our Twitter lamans are equal in Google. Um I, I I am still not getting the 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 answer. Perhaps if they're saying the contract manager uh, also resigned, is no longer part of the system, I would understand. And I, I, I don't understand when they say when we have in front of us chair in black and white the report that says that uh, we have suffered failure of the storage disk, which impacted on transmission. And when we get the response that there was no uh, uh, impact on transmission. So is the report accurate? It's the response accurate? I do not know. The report says there was an impact in transmission due to the failure of, of, of the system. Um, I, 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 I can't get people uh, uh, that were responsible who were managing this contract using the technology. Hence, uh, I'm saying now it's Kita Laman, Aikol and Okay, well, our critique. SABC, how this contract is from 1993, uh, and we are preaching the gospel of the fourth industrial revolution. How has there been no innovation in this sector for 27 years? Because I think that's the point of concern, that the contracts become evergreen. And this is 27 years later. So I think that's why you need to clarify us uh, in so far as this technology you were speaking about is concerned. SABC? Thanks, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, so, so, as we mentioned earlier, this is a perpetual license. In other words, we bought the software. So, it's not about an evergreen contract. Um, so, we bought the software, we own the software, and we can utilize it as long as we want to without having to pay another cent of that. 
However, to upgrade the software and to receive the necessary support, we have a, so a software a maintenance and support agreement, which is outside of that. It's like buying a car, we own the car, but we then have a, a service agreement on top of the car. When that expires, we can extend that, or we can take the risk and, and uh, manage it ourselves or take it to any other dealership. So this is not an, an evergreen thing. We own it. Um, it is still a strategic part of our, um, our infrastructure. Um, it is still one of the best uh, in the world, and it's certainly what our competitors are using as well. Thank you, Honorable Chair. How, how is that not ever proven? Because if the maintenance is the sole pay view of who you bought it from, then it's ever green. Then there's no flexibility about who can service it. I think that's the issue. Let's not play with semantics. The issue is that you are saying it's one of the pairs. Then what are the others? I think COO, you need to understand that point of affliction in so far as we are concerned. Because if they are the only ones, then why do we need to engage in processes of deviations and expansions on it? Because the National Treasury would understand from 93 to date that this is because of action. But the fact that it becomes the finding, it becomes an issue, is what raises the concern. So it is evergreen. It's just a matter of how you couch the evergreenness in it. Thanks, Honorable Chair. So if, if we look at it, and if I were to use a similar comparison, uh, Parliament has implemented Oracle. They've implemented that more than 10 years ago. It is a strategic system that they've used, and they will continue then increase or renew the support and maintenance of that. It's exactly the same uh, analogy over here. This is a strategic tool for us. Um, it, it is, unfortunately, when it comes to broadcasting, there's not many suppliers around the world that, that, that play in this space. It's a limited number of uh, uh, suppliers. So when they set up in-country, um, if it's not a commoditized product where there's many um, end users, then they will not have more than one uh, partner within country that would be uh, able to do that maintenance and support. And that's exactly where we, we, we find ourselves in. No, and to your oh, oh, point... That, oh, that, that, that's not in dispute. That was clearly explained on the 28th of July. We are clear about that. But where I'm trying to get you to understand is that why do we play with semantics? Because then this is an evergreen contract. Because they are the only ones that can do it. Why? why because by trying to run away from it, you make it suspicious. I lay our anxieties and say, look, we are settled with the situation, this is it, and there's no one else. And then we can move on. But every time you try and, and engage in meandos, it, it, may, it, 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 it raises questions. All right, Honorable Chair, I've got a follow-up. Okay, follow okay, let's can take I also add on what you're saying, Chair? Okay, then Honorable Mente, after her, the other thing, sure. Um, um, I, I was struggling to understand the issue of uh, Inala being the exclusive uh, 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 sole supplier. When in your document you've indicated that SABC was given support during the period of June to July 2016 by the local support of Harmonic product on the basis of the delay in the internal processes to conclude this contract. So meaning someone local supported you in, in this regard, yet you are saying Inala it's the only one that has a, 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 a exclusive right to implement the service and the support. Now who internally gave you this support if Inala had, is the only one that can do it uh, on your behalf? during the period that you indicated, uh, who gave you that support and maintenance? All right, Honorable Mentor. Thank you, Chair. Chairperson? 
Yes, you may trust the Honorable Mentor. Now, Chairperson, um, in this OT, and guess it's closer, oh, Honorable Adebun Betim Lunyin, because in between renewing the contracts and, and, and the deviations of Inala, there was a, a local support. And we are, we are not going to sit here and support a notion that we don't have a skill locally. The issues of sole service providers, in many cases, are, 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 are designed by companies. And we must not sit here and be undermined in a manner in which we are today, as if we don't understand the space of broadcasting. There is no such a thing as this particular company is the only company that can provide the service it provides to SABC. Yes, they own the software. They then need maintenance, they need upgrades now and then. One, is this company transferring the skill? Is SABC ever going to capacitate itself in order for it to do its own maintenance on such products? The answer is no, because we must sit here and believe that we don't have such a skill. We can't learn such a skill. This is a, a design which is made to fit in a manner of a pattern this particular sole service provider. And I don't want to understand. I know I'm still coming up, Chef. I don't want to understand. I, I'm not going to understand the justifications that are made here. There's no such a thing. There has been people helping SABC. Let's not be treated like children as if we, we don't read or we don't understand the space of broadcasting. We do. And we read the documents you send to us. Honorable Adebe is asking you on the basis of the information you sent to us. The question is, under normal circumstances, someone knows that the contract is ending. This is then the process. You test the market. Is it a sole provider? Is it proven? And then you ought to do what you have to do. It was not done. So who is the person who did not do it? That's the question. And yeah. that's my thing. Uh, SABC, as you come back to respond, can I just ask, you keep speaking about your competitors who are using this software. Which, who are these competitors? That's one. But secondly, the issue is, when you bought the software, why wasn't it from the onset inclusive uh, of the maintenance costs and the upgrades. Second, thirdly, has there no new uh, technology similar to what you are using um, in the course of the past 26 years? And have you then not tested the market for a new system? So that you lost the issue here is we need to be convinced that, well, this is it. Uh, th thank you, Chair. Can I just, um, am I audible on the other side? Can I just yes. respond uh, to yes, a couple? Yeah. Can, you, can you turn on your camera? All right, that's fine. Proceed. I, I thought it was turned on. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, respond to a couple of questions? So the, the first one on contracts management and whether there was any built-in maintenance and support in the, the that that was there, and it is standard practice in the industry when you are procuring um, um, a system to have at least one or two year um, maintenance agreement. It's part of what is called the operational expenditure component of your uh, procurement cost. 
and it was it was part of that. But uh, what happens is that then um, after that, you then have to start the process of either extending that or going onto the market if uh, you've got different suppliers that can help you. With with the harmonic TV playout system, I mean it's 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 a big system. It's obviously a very expensive system. Once you buy it and it belongs to you, as in as we did with the uh, perpetual licensing that we did, um, it's a question now of maintaining it. Then it's a question of whether you want to go to the market again and go and buy another one within five years, or you want to continue sweating this asset. And in our case, of course, I mean, in the last, um, um, uh, let's say, 23 years or so, we've been trying to sweat the asset. Um, you asked, Che, about whether there's been any innovation in this space uh, for the last 27 years. Um, yes, um, there's been an upgrade on uh, um, the system itself. Uh, we increased the number of channel ports that we put onto the system. We also upgraded the system onto to become high definition as in HD um, in and around 2015. So there's been some innovations in this space uh, taking place in the last um, a few years. The other question that I think Honorable Khadeb asked was around um, contract management. Who has been responsible for this? So the GM for technology podcast resources um, left at the beginning of this year. He is obviously ultimately the person that's responsible for all the playouts or all the systems on our TV facilities um, um, area. And uh, he left um, at the beginning of this year, and therefore um, it's always going to be very difficult for us to uh, to go back and uh, and uh, you know ask for recourse. But maybe we can um, um, if there's any you know legal leg that we can use for that. Just on the break of transmission that uh, Honorable Hadebe also asked about. So there was no break as in the transmission as everybody seeing it um, um, on television because of these storage disks failures. But rather our FCC, which is our final control center, where we actually do a lot of you know planning and programming just before we take everything live. That's where you know the um, inconvenience took place. So these are all the things then that uh, um, um, we, 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 we did at that stage. But just the final question now to uh, Honorable Mente uh, regarding whether we are capacitating ourselves internally to be able to look after these um, 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 systems. So what happens when you buy a system? There's what is called the first level support, the second level support, and the third level support. The first level support normally is internally, which in our case, it is the case as well. Uh, that means we do uh, get some level of training and we are able to look after the system. But then once we it, it goes beyond us, we then take it onto the local supplier, um, um, who normally, I mean, in this case was Inala, and the guys, um, um, if it's beyond them, uh, then it goes to the third level supplier and then they go on to the OEM themselves and the guys that manufactured the actual equipment. And those guys are normally in Europe or in the United States. Um, and uh, that's what happens. But uh, what will happen going forward is for us to try and cut the second level supply or support. We will try and do both first level and second level internally and then only go on to the OEMs whenever there is a huge need for us to do that. So training and all the capacitations that we need to be doing internally as an organization, we will start you know, doing those when, um, 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 when we you know, procure most of the other systems going forward. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. That's, no, that's fine. Let's tie it down. Uh, Parliament TV requests that we turn on our cameras. I had indicated I'm not in a position to do that on my end. Uh, as I would wish, but other colleagues, please. But Honorable Mentor, can we go to you? Um, and then we can try and tie it down uh, for today. But Honorable Mentor, unless colleagues, there's any other follow up? All right, Honorable Mentor. Okay, Honorable Hatteb. No, she's moving to a new section, so finish off on this one. No, 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 thanks, Chair. So I, I, I want to get a sense and understanding so that so there is internal capacity as it was displayed uh, in July uh, 2016 uh, to, to maintain this thing uh, uh, internally. Is, is that the sense I'm getting? I'd like to get that understanding. Because you were able to, to, to afford a, a site while you were busy with this prolonged, uh, unnecessary, tedious process of uh, concluding uh, 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 this deviation. Uh, Chair, if I may come in, in there, Chair. Yes, we do have some 
uh, level of understanding of the system, but we can't fully say we can do it internally, as in both a level one and level two. We can do level one, we show about that, and level two, maybe a bit of level two. That's why we end up you know, using the local supply. But then um, the level three, obviously, is the OEM together with all the upgrades that they, that, that they provide to us. So wh what I'm saying then going forward would be then to in ensure that that capacity is actually you know, fully boosted uh, so that we don't do uh, level two with the local supplier, but rather level two remains within the SABC. And that's, that's what I would like to uh, share with the members. Chair, Chair, for 26 years, you were unable to build internal capacity. There was no return on investment. Uh, hence, Inala will continue to be the sole uh, uh, supplier. 26 years later, you still don't have that capacity. How do you expect us to accept that as normal? You have these people maintaining your system for 26 years. What were you doing? Were you getting new people uh, every after three years? Uh, 100 and, and odd plus staff members have uh, resigned. You are dealing with new people. How old are they in terms of the employment contract, the current staff that you have? What type of skills and experience have they uh, acquired? Uh, from this uh, uh, sole uh, supplier. We cannot continue using a sole supplier and we don't get return on investment. Our people need to be skilled and equipped. We can't outsource work that we can do internally. All right, no, that's fine. That's fine. All right, that will be the last question on this section. Uh, colleagues, I may have uh, not explained properly. They just want the cameras on if you are speaking. Uh, because we are live on the platform. I think I failed to explain adequately, right? Uh, SAPC response and then Honorable Mentor, you can come in. SAPC? Chair, yes. Uh, thank you to Honorable Khadeva for that. Um, yes. It doesn't matter which so software we have within the organization. From a strategic point of view, we would always want to do a level one support. Level two, it depends on the complexity of the software and obviously the strategic nature of it. Level three would never be able to do it. It will always be with the OEM or the, their partners. And once again, if we know that this is going to be a strategic software, for example, our, uh, our recommendation and certainly request was to extend this agreement by five years um, so that we could go there. We are almost forced now to go to market to go look for a possible replacement because Inola will respond to that as well. It, it is exactly the same as Parliament saying there's many uh, ERP systems out there. The fact that we uh, in Parliament implemented Oracle more than 10 years ago, we should now go and test the market to see if SAP or some other system is available. We are, uh, through that and by not being able to treat this as a strategic so, uh, uh, software, we are forced to go down that route. And as soon as you do that, it is very difficult to determine whether you're going to be building a level two support. Because level two support you want to build, if you know this is a strategic software and I'm going to be having it at least for 10 years, 15 years or maybe more. Um, it's very difficult in our environment because continuously we get challenged in terms of whether it's evergreen or whether we are not testing the market uh, uh, sufficiently. So yes, we have built internal capacity. We do have a level one capability of this. Level two, we do not have. It will be um, an external party. And we'd only consider building a level two if we know that this is a software that we're going to be having at least for the next five years to 10 years. Because it is very difficult to build that uh, level of support. Remember that we probably one of only three broadcasters that can use this software in South Africa. So the market is very small. If we build our own internal capacity, it is also very highly that those uh, um, uh, resources get snatched by the supplier and, and our competitors as well. So yes, if it is strategic, we certainly would want to consider a level two. But we do have internal capacity for level one. Thanks, Chair. 
Okay, no, that's fine. I think we had that. I think colleagues would be well served to visit SAPC, to engage with the technical people and the technological people, and to view the structure of these systems, and in the meantime, for our support and research team to investigate for us and research comparatively what is out there, and so that we can look at a national treasury as well in terms of their outlook on this matter. Uh, because however it's termed and phrased, the bottom line is uh, for so long as this system is in place, therefore it follows that the maintenance and upgrade becomes an evergreen contract. I see SAPC is running away from that, but that's the bottom line. So therefore the modalities around the evergreen contract need to be determined and satisfied by national treasury. Otherwise, this becomes a, 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 a finding unnecessarily. So things need to be done properly to satisfy the prescripts that the market is continuously being tested and checking whether um, the necessary knowledge, skills, and expertise are present elsewhere for the purposes of this maintenance. Because we are settled here with an evergreen contract, but I think uh, here we're speaking to the executives and the board, uh, so they want to give us the high level uh, responses. But I think we need to drill into this. Because this is a contract in place for 27 years. Uh, it's six years older, uh, younger than I am. So, it, 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 and, and by the looks of things, it will be with the SAPC well into the future. And we, and we need to deal with that because otherwise it sets into motion the perception that there is an unwillingness to be innovative within the parameters of the fourth industrial revolution. It can't be that it's one uh, uh, company that can have the sole purview in a technological world unless in compelling circumstances. And I don't think SABC has made that case today. And so this is something that needs to remain on our radar and let's engage with the, with the those expertise. So colleagues, I mean, I, I'm just throwing it out there that there may be a need for us to pay an oversight visit to SABC and actually engage at another level uh, at the institution so we can get to the nitty gritties of this. We're speaking about automated uh, contract management. We need to look at that and how it falls into uh, the scheme of things about this project. All right, Honorable Mente, can I hand over to you? Um, Chair, just I think, oh. let us consider, okay, one second, because I think that uh, there is a need, uh, colleagues, uh, looking at what is at SABC to do with SABC. Right? The Honorable Deputy Minister and then Honorable Mente, you can take us through um, your section. Chair, I think I want to agree with your summary that we do a side visit uh, on the on the Inala system. And I think from our side, we'll also have to have Centec, CETA, and National Treasury, so that all of us are one in ensuring that we are able to assist the SABC going forward. All right, now I think we, we can welcome that commitment on the part of the department, the ministry, to expand the scope of our oversight. But obviously, colleagues, I'm throwing a proposal out there. We'll look at it, we will determine its modalities, and then we'll take it from there, uh, and whether it will actually be necessary. But I wanted us to get the technical perspective, as, as we have already gotten the executive perspective. Right? Honorable Mente, over to you now. Thank you, Chair. I, I cannot agree with you more on the visit to the SABC uh, because we can't close the books in terms of these deviations without thoroughly investigating and engaging them. Uh, Chair, with your permission, I want to 
uh, have a, an exercise with the chairperson of the board, if he's still here. I hope he's still here. Chairperson of the board, letters that are requesting um, most of these deviations in the annex charts sent by your good office to us, and some, uh, in fact, all of them sent to Treasury, are bearing signatures of officials and or executives that are at SABC. I want to dispel the myth and the notion that these are mostly 90% done by people who cannot be traced or not known to SABC or have left SABC. Chair one, can I check with the chairperson of the board or the CEO as an accounting officer? Is Irene Marutla here? Yes. Yes, right. uh, honorable member, she is, and she's part of the meeting. In a she's sitting in a different office, but she's part of this meeting. Okay, let's do that. Uh, uh, when did she start working? And when, when uh, especially in the sphere of the SCN? Let me request the CFO to give those specifics uh, from an employment point of view. Um, CFO? Uh, th thank you, Chair, and thank you, Member. Uh, so I don't exactly know when she started, but I think when we, we met you last time, we did indicate dates. However, she was a category manager um, for a very long time. I think it's how she started her career here. She became the acting head of supply no, chain uh, in April. Uh, oh, 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 no, 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 wait, wait, wait. Because she's here, it's best that she gives us Mm. Uh, yeah, yeah that's, what you said, she's present. Yes, so she let's is. Get, yeah, all right, let's get that from her. That's, uh... Ms. Marutla, when did you start working with the SCM environment? Especially around uh, procurement. Good morning, um, honorable members, and good morning, um, colleagues. Um, thank you for the question. I started to work at SABC in 2008 as a category manager in the SCM environment. So in the SCM. And then in the SCM where you're specifically dealing with procurement or you were, you were in another area and then you came to procurement? I've always been dealing with supply chain uh, in procurement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mama uh, Yolande, how long have you been with the procurement? Uh, I am not in procurement, ma'am. I'm a chartered accountant. I'm the chief financial officer, um, but I'm responsible for procurement. Thank you. Uh, ba, ba, ma, do, dem, ka, kwe. Uh, I've been with the SAPC since July 2018. Okay, thank you, that. Now, Chairperson, we have a letter here that was sent to Treasury, Chief Procurement Officer, National Treasury, signed by the three signatories, I've just asked how long have they been there. On the 5th of September 2019, on the 5th of September 2019, both Ms. Marutla and Ms. Yolande signed on the 5th, and the CEO signed on the 26th of September 2019. What was this letter about? This letter was requesting a deviation on SAP, the System SAP Software Maintenance Agreement. Their motivation on page 205 is that the current system 
let's bear in mind that this system has been there initially from December 2005 on a perpetual contract renewal agreement. Then the current one, which they were uh, asking a deviation based on was the one which started on the 1st of January 2017, expiring in 31st December 2019. All three signatories have been with SABC. None have left. Now, within that period of the three-year agreement, under ordinary circumstances, someone ought to know that the contract was going to end. But no, we will not do anything. We will simply ask for a deviation because within the law, a deviation is allowed. But a deviation is, is a circumstantial law method. Now, under this particular one of SAP, you signed a letter in September requesting a deviation for, for two years with a treasury. Treasury responds on the 25th of October, 2019, saying, no, I'm giving you six months to do what you were supposed to have done January 2019 in order for the contract to have ample time for the renewal or the new bid uh, processes. No one did that. Treasury comes back to you and says, no, we asked this question in the previous um, uh, meeting. You come back again same signatories, write another letter. You tell Treasury you can't. We asked you to give us two years because this contract cannot be broken down on a month to month. It's an annual uh, costed contract. Treasury comes back and says, no, I will not give you two years. I'll give you a year. One. This is the first problematic area here is the fact that we can't have a contract that cannot be broken down month to month. And in, a meet, in the previous meeting, we agreed. It's a very risky thing because you cannot have a person that you cannot uh, 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 change their contract. You cannot terminate it simply because it's annually. But the most problematic area is that when this contract was about to expire, all three signatories were there. Now I'm coming back to the very same question, Ka Honorable Hade. Who was responsible to look into this particular contract and ensure that the renewal or the new bid process is undertaken? I'm asking the three signatories. You can go to deviation. There was no need to go to deviation. The contract are sitting in front of you. You see all of them. You have a diary. You know which contract is ending when. But just before it ends, September, October, November, December, three months before the contract, in fact, four months, because the first signature was on the 5th of September. Three months, four months before it ends, you ask for a deviation. Why didn't you kickstart a process in January 2019? Who was supposed to have kickstarted the process of a new contract in January 2019? Thank you, Che. All right, let's get a response to that. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I will um, try to respond. 
So, uh, as much as I understand the members' frustration, uh, having been a, a direct client of SAP, as I indicated in my introduction, uh, and the fact that it does allow us, and certainly uh, preferential pricing, when the process starts, which it starts well in time, the business case for the matter would have been signed off around July or August. Um, the letter that goes out in September, noting that I earlier indicated Treasury uh, typically wants to respond between 14 days and a month, so the letter is well in time. Uh, what we do not expect, obviously, is, is the response, um, and having been in a three-year relationship at that point in time, we were not aware of, of the changing environment in terms of how SAP deals with its direct clients, or certainly Treasury's view of a matter like this. Um, so, we, we start in time uh, as per the notifications with enough time for Treasury to respond as they should ordinarily have had. What we did not anticipate um, is that the rejection of our request. Um, I think previously I also tried to explain that in the case of this kind of maintenance and support, and we did inquire from the OEM uh, whether we can break it down in a period and they declined the request. Um, uh, and, and we are then, as a result, in any case now, one of the sub, sub, supplementary documents speaks to the fact that for maintenance and support, we are now um, doing an RFP for next year, um, and SAP may, may uh, submit a bid as well if they wanted to. But we were in time, and um, based on our understanding of the environment and the relationship um, at when, when the initial request goes. Honorable Manta, you can Ma proceed. Mama Yolande, you were in time to ask for a deviation. My question is, this didn't warrant a deviation. It, it certainly did not warrant a deviation. It's a contract that was supposed to end. Someone knew it was ending, but no, Let's give them some leeway and give them time to take the money of the SABC once more. I said uh, 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 when I was starting that let's bear in mind that this contract has been with SABC since 2005. We don't want to drill down on the findings of the AG where this uh, particular contract is concerned with the, all the irregularities that are always arising out of it. But my question is, you were in time for a deviation. Why were you not in time to put in the RFP then? Why did it have to take Treasury to tell you that, no, don't do it. Go out, look for a contract, do something. If sub want to come back, they must also be it just like everybody else. Why were you not in time to do what you, were, what you are doing now? Let's put it under ordinary circumstances. Who was supposed to have done what when? Let's leave the deviation out. About what time or date in this contract was it supposed to have been paid attention to in terms of starting a new contract and adverts and everything. When was that supposed to happen and be done by who? So, so Chair, just before I hand over to our um, uh, CMO, <clears throat> it would have started at the same time, uh, Honourable Member. Uh, you have an option to either uh, make use of these mechanisms that as we have been pointed out that it is available in law or you can start a new process. So it would have started at the same time and it is started within a similar time frame currently for the, the, the initiation of the contract for the next year. But let me hand over to my COO as well. Um, thanks, Chair and Honourable uh, Member Mente. Um, so in the past, what government was doing is having strategic relationships with ERP suppliers, so like SAP, like Oracle. So unlike where the, the norm would be that you go out on the RFP and their partners would respond to the RFP, 
we were working directly with the OEM in this case, in this case being SAP. And so the renewals of that on a, on, on, on a three-year basis would be with SAP, who was the original supplier, um, and the agreement was with them. Up until recently where that has changed, where Must go out on an RFP to uh, allow other SAP partners. It's still on the SAP system that they will be supplying the maintenance and support, but allow other SAP partners to also respond. Now, previously we didn't need to do that, and that's why we didn't need to do a deviation, uh, uh, basically. But because we now need to go out and um, uh, on the open RFP with uh, SAP partners. That's the only reason why we needed a deviation just for that short period of time, um, because we could do that. This is called annual maintenance and support. So no organization out there breaks that down in less than one year. Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, the longer the term, the cheaper it is for the organization. If you do a one year annual maintenance and support, it's going to cost you more than if you were to do a three or five. But no organization out there, certainly the big suppliers and no ERP system, um, would give you less than a year. Um, so if you look at, for example, um, Parliament using Oracle, as I said, they would have a three to five year maintenance and support agreement with either Oracle or one of Oracle suppliers. It's exactly the same case, but in our case, we were just using SAP. Thank you, Chair. I'm going to try. I'm going to try for the last time, Che. For the last time. You have justified on your second letter to Treasury the reasons why you want to get a two-year extension. Exactly what the COO is saying that because it's cheaper when you are doing it annually and a, 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 everything. There's no problem. My problem is, even when that three years expire, someone is supposed to sit, monitor all contracts. The fact that a deviation is used within the law, it's under extreme circumstances. Perhaps let me ask this question the other way around. What were the circumstances that your office or your official or the executive or whoever it is that was supposed to have renewed this contract when the time came to renew? When the month of renewal, eh, 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 this thing was not renewed. Who was there? And what was the circumstances that this particular contract could not be renewed? Therefore, it warranted you to ask Treasury. Because you can't just write to Treasury willy-nilly, no, because we have this particular uh, uh, um, law. We can use it as and when we want to. When we don't, when we just want to be lazy in the office. It's fine. We'll take a recourse. We have a law that allows us to do that. But that's not the case. A deviation is a deviation on the basis that there's something that is hindering you. But this time around, I want to know what were those impediments? And after knowing those impediments, the person who was supposed to have overseen this particular contract, who? Is that person? All right, let's get those responses. Honorable Adeb, I've noted that you want to come in. Well, let's get a response, and then Honorable Mentumaye Kriba, uh, then you can come in. This ABC. Uh, thank you, um, Chairperson, and thank you for the opportunity once again. Um, I just want to clarify uh, before I answer 
uh, about the request to national treasury. Our request it was who's not speaking clear. and who's clarifying. It's Irene Maruta Che. Right there you go. All from right. supply chain yes. management. Right. But we didn't see you there. All right, you may now proceed. My camera is on. Um, che. Okay. Our request to National Treasury, firstly, it was not to replace the ERP system. On the document that has been submitted to yourself, it has indicated the CAPEX that has been uh, invested on this system. So our request to National Treasury, it was for continuity of the already system that is continuing, which is SEP ERP system. And in terms of the deviation, as the honorable member has noted, we asked, we requested the national treasury to approve our deviation four months before the contract expired. So we were on time for that and take into consideration the timelines that national treasury has communicated them to us. So I think what the member is, is was expecting is that we were supposed to maybe replace the system or go out on a new system of which it was not the case. And even when National Treasury responded to say we need to go out on tender, we had to engage them to understand exactly what does that mean because it was not clear. We wanted to know if they are suggesting that we must approve the SEP system and replace a new system. And during those engagements, we came to agreement to say we will go out on tender for the maintenance since SEP do allow other partners to maintain the system. So in terms of the deviation chair, we were right on time and SABC acted accordingly within the prescripts that are provided in supply chain management. Thank you. I wanted to, 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 to assist her, especially on this matter. All right, sis, man, let's get the assistance, all right. Yeah, no, I, 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 as, as they saying to us, they didn't know what was happening on the market. Only when they have submitted to Treasury, they only realized only then that no, by the way, SEP do allow other partners to do maintenance. So it took National Treasury to tell them what was happening on the market. Yet, uh, Mona, as the custodian, they didn't know. Someone was sleeping on the job. Hence, honorable men, they want to know. So for you to be able to know what's happening, National Treasury must tell you, that, no, 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 you can't uh, uh, open-endedly ask for deviation and use one person. By the way, SEP does allow you to, 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 to uh, go and open tender and get other partners to do maintenance. Is that what they're telling us? That they did not know they were sleeping on duty until National Treasury wake them up to say, hello, by the way, this is what you need to do. Is that the understanding? And if that's the case, Chair, I don't understand why are they still there. Um, Chair. Chair. All right. Uh, this, um, CFO, you can proceed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say, um, th typically the most financially and business sustainable relationship you can have is with the OEM because you work directly with them and you will get a certainly significant price benefits typically. And because there's no middleman in between, the access to support and other kinds of services are just so much more efficient. So having had that relationship with the OEM all these years, um, it, it was certainly reasonable for us to assume that it will be safe to carry on with them because of these very benefits that you get when you work with an OEM, irrespective of the nature of the service or the product that you have. Okay. I think, Honorable, let us, let us tie this down. Chairperson, Chairperson, the question is, were they not aware that SEP 
allows other partners to maintain the system. What is reasonable for them is not reasonable for other competitive partners out there. So they must not tell us what's reasonable for them, which is shortcuts. I'm asking, where are they not aware? What they are doing now, were they not aware until National Treasury tell them? All right, response? Uh, Honorable Chair, yes, thank you. Uh, yes, we we were and are aware of that. When you buy uh, software directly from the OEM and you don't go through a partner, the discount that they would normally offer to the partner, they offer to you as well, so you can get it for cheaper. When you get maintenance and support via a partner, there's a discount there that the partner enjoys. If you do it directly with the OEM, they pass that discount on to you, and so you can get it for cheaper. That's what we've been enjoying with the OEM for the past years. What National Treasury was uh, saying at the end is that we should stop that now and go to market. That's the only reason why we never in the past did that, and we prepare to do that now going forward. And, and yes, it might be that we're going to pay more for it, but at least we're going to be compliant. That's, I suppose, it's the cost of compliance. Chair, just to add from uh, the technology perspective, we, we've already embarked on that process already. Um, we're already um, having our uh, tenant documents out uh, onto some of the SAP suppliers that are already uh, operating in this space in the, in the country. I think what is key to what this, uh, the COO is saying is that we now are no longer going to enjoy those cost benefits that we used to enjoy when we did um, a business directly with the OEM, which is SAP in this case. So we will now have the middle person that will always be there working with us. Um, and therefore, whatever you know, markups that they are putting from um, are the cost that they are given by the OEM, they obviously are going to pass that to us. So uh, that is just the only difference that made the um, our national treasury to say, go to the market and work with so many other people. But they were not saying, let us replace the entire ERP system. Because if that was the case, then we would have built the business case, and then we go out there and say we want to replace the entire um, um, ERP system, and then everybody, including Oracle, who, who is an OEM as well, would have then you know come in and uh, provided their own proposals, and then they can also you know tell us who are, are they are you know are certified partners in the country that they work with. So that is basically what uh, we're trying to explain that we now are, are asked to work with a supplier instead of us working directly with the OEM, which used to yield a lot of benefits for us as the SABC. Thank you, Chair. Honorable Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I'm a bit astonished at the SABC's um, position that by going to the market, it's going to cost more. The market surely includes the OEM, and the OEM can also put in a tender. And if they can provide the service cheaper than others, as the SABC officials seem to think they can, well then, that's the tender to take. But at least the process has been followed, and it's a fair and open process. I, I, I am... Unless, of course, the National Treasury is saying to the SABC, you may not use the OEM. Please, can I get clarity if that is the case? All right, let's get a response. Thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you to the Honourable Member. Uh, no, there's, there's no limitations. Obviously, anybody can respond to the tender. Generally, what OEMs do, if they are going to use partners, they would not respond then. They would allow the partner to respond. Um, that's, those are just agreements that they would have. But we would go out with this, and obviously uh, SAP could also respond uh, directly. Generally, as I say, it's not the case. Um, if they are going to be responding, they generally then would be responding through partners and not directly. 
but nothing stops them from not from our side. I don't know what the agreements they would have with their partners. All right, um, colleagues. Chair. Yes, Chair. honourable member. Now, chairperson, we 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 are not going to get to the point where we want to get to. Because there is defence mechanism. There is now they the the officials of SABC now have 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 um, resorted to some condescending attitude. That if that's then the price it takes uh, for for compliance, there's national treasury. They have a CPO office there. You do not engage them. When you engage them, they show you the new methods and the processes. And after that, you still write back to them. You are still not clear as to what is it that you want? But there's one thing you must rest assured of. We are not in a business of motivating and encouraging you to keep evergreen contracts. They might look cheap, but then also processes are there to be followed. The law is there to be complied with. But in you complying, you ought to also be very clear. You can't come here and be condescending like that, that if then that's the, that's, the, that's the price we have to pay for complying, it's fine. We're going to lose this, we're going to lose that, we're going to lose that. National Treasury is there to determine. There is a CPO that works with you on, on all those things of procurement. So why didn't you clarify it with National Treasury? Why did it have to come to us? We're going to investigate it when it comes to us. Because it talks to a process that was not properly followed. If you want to make up your own company, and it should, it should be that's just SAP or, or nothing. Because SAP is going to offer you this and that and that, or all the cost benefits. It's not going to be acceptable. That's the law. And it's not going to drive the capacity of, 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 of SABC to a, a level where we all want it to be. That's just a fact. You can't come here and undermine us like that. I know. Then if you also believe, you are now telling us that, no, if you believe that, we must just follow the process simply because the process is a process. But we are telling you what you are doing is cheap. What you are doing is cheap, but in terms of the law, it's not followed properly. That's the problem here. The fact that you've built 100 houses when you were given a million rent to build them, but in building the 100 houses you used, your girlfriend, whose company got a tender through you, that's not following the law, even if they had built all 100 houses. But the fact that now it's nepotism, it means you are on the wrong. That's what we're arguing here. You cannot just come and, and do whatever you want and not follow the law. The problem is that you cannot also exploit the law. You can't because there are deviations that can, you can use, and you must just deviate on everything without explaining them. I'm sure the CPO and Treasury Office is not dumb. You can understand when you're saying, we want to do these things this way, simply because of one, two, three, four, five. And then he's going to allow you to do it like that. But the moment he queries it, it means there's something wrong with the prescripts of the law and you did not do what you came, you had to do. We can't circumvent it. Thank you, Chair. All right. Now, I think, colleagues, we, we have, the points have been, the points have been substantively uh, made. Uh, I think we, what SAPC needs to understand is that two wrongs don't make a right. 
due process, adherence to process is the baseline of all accountability. And obviously there are serious issues which need clarification. And SAPC must be in a position to explain to us and rationalize to us its dilemmas so that we can be in a position to support them when they've convinced us. And that's why I keep saying this running away from the reality confronting them is what is causing a problem. Fundamentally, SAPC is settled with green contract. That is a reality that is there. It is the circumstances in those green contracts that SAPC needs to explain as times change and move. And I think the inability to do that in a manner which inspires confidence is sits as an indictment squarely on the shoulders of SAPC. Contracts from 93, 2005 and 2020 in a, in a particularly when the Department of Communications is charged with spearheading and championing the fourth industrial revolution agenda in the country, you would expect that the departments and the entities are at the forefront of innovation for new technologies. And so the more things change, the more they seem to stay the same. And that is the issue. And so, colleagues, it's, that's what was motivating the suggestion. Let us go to SAPC and see what is there. Engage with uh, everybody. And also, we'll still have to talk to National Treasury substantively about the nature of the deviations and expansions program uh, at, uh, at, at SAPC. Because if you read between the lines, the PFMA here is being blamed. If you listen very, very carefully, uh, you, you find that it, 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 it's on the receiving end of saying, well, now we have to comply. We have to do this in a complex world. Competitors are doing things, and we are bogged down with your processes. That's what comes out of this. So, I think we, we are far from over with uh, the, the deviations and expansions of SAPC. Uh, so, colleagues, I was hoping that we can tie it down there because we are going in circles now and the responses are not forthcoming. And this does not take away from the dilemma which has been presented that you inherited problems. But what we also have not heard, where are the consequences? Where are the substantive investigations to remedy some of the, no, not some, the problems we've inherited? A turnaround strategy which does not have consequence management and investigations. Intent is future misdemeanors and misbehavior and corruption. So the SAPC will do well things to pursue the people who collapsed the SAPC because that's what they've said, that the institution was hollow. There are people who are known, who are in the employ of the SAPC. They must be pursued because it's not as if there was a wholesale resignation. Some of these people still are within the institution and they must be pursued internally so that you can clear the air about all these issues uh, which, are, which, which are there. So the SAPC must understand that we are going to hold them accountable to the processes in place and they must adhere to it. And I don't think that we have arrived at a point where we are substantively convinced about those challenges. So can I hand over to the chairperson of the board to make concluding remarks? and then to the Deputy Minister and then colleagues who will uh, tie it down in that fashion. Thank you, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members. Um, 
for the engagement. I do want to emphasize a few things. One, as the board and the executive team, we are open to getting input from SCOPA to assist us in turning around the SABC. And I appreciate the fact that there is acknowledgement that we inherited an organization that had totally collapsed. And to rebuild it, build it will take a bit of time. And uh, we, we're going to need the support. And so far, we've received quite a lot of support, even from National Treasury, because for us to get the 3.2 billion rand, they had given us a number of conditions. And one of those was consequence management. And there's a lot that has been done in that area. And I'll be very happy for the opportunity just to take you through the detail of how many have been processed and finalized. Um, and of course, some of these things takes its own life when it gets into a litigation process. It can take a little bit longer. But with the help of the SAU, uh, we've been able to make progress in that area. And um, we were trying our level best to provide the responses. And if it came across as if maybe we are um, being condescending, it's not clearly the intention, and it's not what we, we, we uh, were trying to do. That is being flashed in front of us there. Can we not interrupt the chairperson? Apologies about that. Um, uh, so clearly, I want to apologize if it came across as if we are condescending, but we're trying our level best to provide enough responses and information that was requested. And that's why when we were setting up the team, we made sure that we have the people from operations, we've got the executive team and the chair of the audit and risk, because we just wanted to make sure that we've got everybody around the table who can provide the details that's required. But I do agree with the recommendation uh, coming from the chair and supported by some members that maybe a visit to SAPC can provide us ample time where we can take you through what we're trying to do, take you through our system so that we can be able to really explain and also show you some of the things that we are dealing with. And I think that will really progress and help us um, uh, find each other and maybe uh, also help you um, as find ways in which you can assist us. Because we do need everybody's support really to turn around the SAPC. I mean, to turn around an organization that has collapsed over decades and to turn it around, I mean, we've been at this thing for like just two years and it will take a bit of time for us to really rebuild and get uh, the SAPC where all of us, we can be proud of. But I'm very grateful for the support that we've received from, also from the ministry, from National Treasury. And um, I can assure you that the team that we have, they are all committed to do the right thing. They are all uh, really um, up to the task. And uh, it's because some of these things really predate them. And when people did these things with an intention to hide it from the authorities, they would make it a point that it's hard for us to untangle some of it. But we're doing our best to close all of those loops and to make sure that SAPC is the one that we can all be proud of. And if you do check some of the outcomes or the results, we've been able to drive down the cost. Uh, we've been able to deal with some of the things that were uh, uh, fundamentally collapsing and causing a problem for the SAPC. But I think a visit would really allow us days where we can engage and share more information with the, with, with, with the honorable members. I'm grateful for the opportunity and thanks to the team and to the ministry. All right, no, thank you very much, Mr. Chairperson. Deputy Minister Kekona. Thank you, thank you, honorable chair, and, and thanks to all honorable members. Uh, I also want to appreciate the inputs and the guidance that the Standing Committee on Finance is given to our entity, but I also want to assure the Standing Committee that we will be working very closely with the SABC to give it support and make sure that some of the things that are intended to improve performance in the SABC uh, are realized and and chair that's why i even said at some point we'll have to take on board centec and the reason why i say centec is because it was an engineering and broadcasting and technology uh, unit of the sabc so initially before 1994 there was no company called centec so they will have to be part of us to assist us on how they can really assist the SABC. And I think CETA and Treasury are very relevant because there are licenses, technology licenses that Treasury has bought, that CETA has, 
that we may not, as our entities, repeat to buy those licenses, but piggyback on what National Treasury and CETA has. So that's why I'm saying, maybe let's have all of us there and see how best can we assist uh, the SABC to save funds. So in that chair, we'll be joining you when you visit the SABC to make sure that we give it the necessary support. Thank you. Um, no, thank you very much, uh, Honorable uh, Deputy Minister and two colleagues. Uh, I think that SABC must leave here that our understanding of the challenges that they have does not mean we are happy with the responses we have received. We are not satisfied, and that, amongst other things, I believe is what triggers the oversight visit and the focus uh, on SABC anew following our meeting on the 28th of July and our meeting today. Uh, things have to change at a pace which tells us that there's a commitment to turning things around. <clears throat> and these evergreen contracts remain a sore point uh, for us. So thank you very much. Uh, colleagues, we were scheduled to meet with uh, ESCOM tomorrow. However, when we had that mishap last week and scheduled for tomorrow, they did not indicate to us that they were meeting, they were already scheduled to meet with appropriations. And so because the uh, colleagues tend not to like these joint meetings for a host of reasons that our focuses are very different from other committees, it's best that we um, put ESCOM on hold until we can be able to meet them alone. But members may attend appropriations tomorrow, uh, and the link to that regard will be sent. But we did not want to cloud issues between what appropriations is dealing with and what we are dealing with. It was fundamentally the final announcement is that. Uh, the oversight details for uh, will be finalized. Well, uh, it's currently being finalized, and members will receive their information as time goes on. But I'm sure that by tomorrow afternoon, all members will be up to date so far as their arrangements are concerned. And uh, the final point is that uh, I hope, Sister B, all members have received the the report Yaga Public Works. I know that there was a clean ascending it on Friday because of a technicality on the part of the department, but it was received and I was asked that it be circulated. So members should have it by now. If not, please make sure that they have it. Honorable Hatwaga, the Tonu Mati, the Tonu Begis. No, 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 Chair, I, oh. I want to say. ESCOM is prolonging the inevitable. We'll be patiently waiting, Chair. In fact, uh, Asinda, we, we will meet. Asinda, I, Chair. Yeah. No colleagues, on that, on that note, I would like to thank you, uh, colleagues. And you have a wonderful afternoon. There's a sitting at 2. And uh, SAPC, we will be in touch about uh, future developments, meetings, and oversight. Uh, colleagues, have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. They are prolonging the inevitable. Uh,